Chris Mikowski of Emerging Civil War for the American Battlefield Trust. We're exploring Stones River, and I am on one of the most iconic landscapes of the entire Civil War, and certainly one of the most icon iconic landscapes here at Stones River. These limestone formations covered with moss and today covered with leaves, it's almost eldritch and ancient looking. It's absolutely surreal the way this maze of stones twists and turns together, almost like the surface of a brain. And it's here that the federal position is really going to make a desperate stand that's going to help save the army from the surprise attack that the Confederates launch on the morning of December 31st. To talk about the intense struggle that happens here in Stone River's slaughter pen, I'm gonna turn things over to my friend, historian Jim Lewis, Chief Ranger here at Stones River. Well, thanks, Chris. And yeah, these uh, rocks, in fact, are ancient. Um, you know, based on what I've read from what geologists believe, this, these rocks are the remnants of a prehistoric inland sea that used to cover a good deal of the Middle Tennessee region. And although these are unique uh, to this spot, particularly because of their fighting, throughout the wooded areas of Stones River National Battlefield, you will find karst features like this uh, here th uh, through, throughout this area. Um, and these rocks here were something that were very much on the minds of the men uh, of uh, James Negley's uh, Union Division, particularly Colonel John Miller's brigade, uh, as they began to get orders down to them around 10 o'clock on the morning on December 31st, 1862. At that point, Philip Sheridan's division, as we discussed earlier, had been bent backwards basically almost 90 degrees and was now holding the tree line to the south facing the Wilkinson Pike, while Negley's men had been out just beyond the, this, this wood line here along the fence and McFadden, historic McFadden Lane, which is now called Van Cleve Lane today. Um, beating back Confederate assaults against this position. Now, when Sheridan and Negley realize what they're in, which is basically a salient, um, I'm sure at that point they're probably trying to figure out how to get themselves out of it because anybody that, you know, understands, you know, military tactics, and certainly they did, knows that a salient can be attacked from all sides at once. And if it is, you know, if one side or the other is driven in, or God forbid both, then ultimately you're driven into each other uh, and essentially surrounded. But they weren't going to have that option because by the time they start fi figuring out that situation, General Rosecrans, who has been up by the crossing in the river watching the elements of, of Crittenden's left wing cross to prepare for his attack, by the time he realizes that he's not going to get the four hours he had wanted, um, he now has to make some pretty critical decisions. Um, because his army is in danger of dying here. And so he makes really two. One, he cancels that attack across the Stones River and begins trying to put his army on the defensive. But in order to do that, he needs to buy some time. And that time is going to be bought here because he's going to send orders to Sheridan and Negley telling them that for all intents and purposes, he's going to sacrifice these two divisions to save the rest of the army. And so once that word trickles down to Miller and his men, well, they're out there on the road, but, you know, they had kind of moved through and seen this position here, and they said, well, by God, if we got to stay here, Mother Nature has given us a, you saw Chris rising up, Mother Nature has given us a perfect position from which to defend ourselves. It is a fortification for us. And so they will back into here, and Sheridan's men will back into the woods, and they will brace themselves. And those five Union brigades over the course of almost two hours will face off with nine Confederate brigades. That's nearly half the Confederate Army. And they will beat them back. Now, luckily for the, for the Union forces here, it's not going to be all nine at once. It's going to be one brigade at a time here and there, and then they'll be driven back. Uh, you know, communications and coordination is always a big problem for armies on a Civil War battlefield. But then ultimately around noon, General A.P. Stewart, commanding a brigade in General Benjamin Franklin Cheatham's All Tennessee Division, will organize with four other brigade commanders a concerted assault at that time. And you'll basically have five Confederate brigades converging on all sides of this V at once. Uh, by that point, Sheridan's men, who have been actively engaged for almost two hours, 
He has lost two of his three brigade commanders already. Uh, some of his units have already lost 50% of their men. They will finally break and give way and pass to the, you know, to the, to the north and west of this position we're standing in right now, back into the woods towards the Nashville Pike. What that means for Miller and his men stand, you know, standing their ground here, with Miller urging his men on, telling them, let's just show them how brave men can die, which I'm not really sure is the way to make men feel like they're in a good position. Um, they will find themselves with Confederates to their front, Confederates to their right, and now with the pursuit of Sheridan's remnants behind them, Confederates in their rear. And what had been an excellent defensive position now becomes a death trap. Because you can imagine, you can see all this rockiness behind me. Imagine running through that, trying to get out. And as soon as they begin to try to pick their way out of here, the Confederates will begin to move in. They will get up on top of these rocks, start picking them off like basically fish in a barrel. Some of the men will manage to work their way out and back up to the Nashville Pike. They are not completely surrounded here. But by the time it's over, soldiers' descriptions of this area, I mean, it's kind of interesting that we have a rainy day today. And we're not getting up on these rocks too much because they get kind of slick. They're slick today with rain. Based on the descriptions back then, imagine this had a red tint to it. They were slick, so slick with blood, you would slide right off. And a couple of soldiers from Chicago even noted that you could see blood running through the cracks and running down into the low spots. And it reminded them of the floor drains back in the slaughter pens of the stockyards of Chicago. And that's how this place gets its name. It's forever after known as the slaughter pen. Now, after all that is done, you got, you know, by, by lunchtime on December 31st, 1862. Wait, wait, you, I got to stop well, you there. So after that description, you're talking about lunchtime. <laughs> yeah, well, it is. It's noon. It's 1230. You've got the entire right wing of the Union Army, three divisions strong, is gone. You've got Negley's division, which is part of Thomas's center wing. They're running for their lives. That's four divisions. There's eight in the entire Union Army. So half of the Union Army is beaten by the time the slaughter pen fight is over. And I always ask visitors that are down here with me, who do you think is winning the battle this time? And what do you think they universally say? The Confederates. And in fact, if you're a man on the ground, that is exactly what happens, you know, is happening. The Confederates are winning the battle. But if you get up at the higher level and think about the fact that what Rosecrans had these guys fight here for was a delay to buy him time to build a new line of defense to protect his lifeline along the Nashville Pike, these two hours are where the Battle of Stones River begins to shift to become one of the most important Union victories of the war. It is a costly move, but it is really what begins to shift the tide. And, and what I would say, I assume I'm audible from here, Jim. Thank you for that. Um, so a couple of things. One, time, one thing you hear is that you'll find through the videos is that, you know, Rosecrans is pretty active here. He's not on the scene here, but eventually he gets word that this is more than a skirmish, then it's a disaster. And he starts moving troops over to this position, right? And then, you know, so I, I also have heard, and you can correct me if I'm wrong too, but the Confederates, I mean, their goal isn't to nail the Union's forces here and get bogged down. They're trying to get to the turnpike. They're trying to get to the road. And they were supposed to be a hammer with, I think it's McCown in front and Claiborne behind him. And this fighting has rendered that where you don't have a hammer, you have a wider line. It's going to slow them down and, like you said, give uh, uh, Rosecrans some time to scramble reinforcements, abandon his own plans for an attack, and come back. One other thing I want to pass on to you here is that we are at a slaughter pen, and I know that you all know that it's a, it's not real, but people say that every battlefield has a slaughter pen, that every battlefield has a railroad or a railroad cut check here at Stones River. It's said that every battlefield has, you know, a bloody something, a sunken road check here at this one. So do you have a bloody anything at this battlefield? Not a bloody. The only other place we'll visit that has a nickname has a hell in it, though, and I think there's a lot of them on battlefields, too. Yeah, I agree. Uh, hell's half acre. So, uh, but yeah, I, 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 I can't think of a battlefield I've not been to that doesn't have a slaughter pen. I mean, it is a, although I got to say, ours is pretty unique. I think yours is, and I'm a Gettysburg guy, this is the coolest slaughter pen. And I'm also a trust guy, and we love the slaughter pen farm at Fredericksburg. 
This is the coolest one. As I try to navigate my way back through the cracks here, I think of Nancy <laughs> Reagan, just say no to crack. Um, this, is, wow. this is really hard to navigate. <laughs> I didn't expect because, that. <laughs> um, one thing to, you know, most of these crevices are, are perpendicular to the action. So when the Federals are trying to pull out, they're trying to go that way. And so that makes it even more difficult to try to navigate through here. Jim, I want to kind of poke over here for just a second. We can see this cutout, uh, which looks a lot like you with your hat today, by the way. Yes. I think because it is me, although it's not the same hat. Yes, uh, we use some of these silhouettes and I've been here so long, I joke around that now I've actually become a monument on the battlefield. Uh, but we decided, um, I actually stole this idea from my friends at Cowpens uh, National Battlefield. They have a couple of these silhouettes on their battlefield, uh, obviously Revolutionary War. And I thought that, you know, in some places to try to help people visualize a little bit more of what they're seeing, not beyond just the landscape that we could use these. Uh, and so they took pictures of me firing my musket, standing and kneeling, and now they are cut out and weathering steel to be here for who knows how long. We also, as we'll see in some other places, have some cannon silhouettes that we use to kind of fill in the gaps, particularly up at the, by the river where the 57 guns were firing. Um, it's frankly prohibitively expensive to put 57 full-size replica cannons out there, but by peppering in some 3D real cannons with some of those uh, silhouettes, you can really begin to give people a sense of what that gun line would have looked like. And let me just add real quick, you know, the trust, we only have these on one of our battlefields. That's at the Cedar Mountain battlefield. And we have found, Jim, you can tell me if that's the case here. People either love these things or they despise these things. Is that what you find? That's true. Yeah, there's not a lot of wishy-washiness about these things. <laughs> Although over the probably 15 years we've had these on the battlefield, I would say about 80 percent of the people really like them, um, that it helps them. Because where we have them, like here in the slaughter pen, it allows them to see, oh, a kneeling soldier in the rocks. So it's part of that story we were telling. We're just trying to give them just, just two of them, not too many. We don't want a whole line of them in here. But uh, it gives them a, a, you know, a chance to sort of add that uh, part to the visual that they're, they're building in their mind. And I'm in this that camp as well. Chris, do you want to wrap us up and maybe sure. we'll take go through the rocks a little? Just a fantastic uh, little behind the scenes into some of the interpretive challenges here. We were also talking about you know being in an urban environment. You hear sirens going on back and forth. So a very uh, unique battlefield with some unique, wonderful interpretive uh, challenges and and tools to rise to meet those challenges, which makes your opportunity to come here and stand among these rocks a really an opportunity to come back into time and get an evocative sense of what things might have felt like and put yourself in these rocks to put yourself in the shoes of the soldiers that fought here at the slaughter pen at Stones River. Gary, thank you so much. Chris White behind the camera, he's doing stunt work right now, which is fantastic. Jim, as always, this is just great. I am geeking out. This is so much fun. You're with the American Battlefield Trust. Thanks so much for being with us. More to come.